<coughs> welcome to one more topic of nephrology and this one is about chronic renal disease or core chronic kidney disease uh, by the way it is called a CKD so chronic kidney disease is more appropriate name to give this and uh, as I told you it is the end result of almost all the um, kidney diseases like whatever it is it is glomerulonephritis it is tubular inter, uh, interstitial nephritis it is um, acute tubular necrosis it is diabetes it is hypertension it is drugs it is toxins it is hereditary conditions like uh, adult polycystic kidney disease you know uh, all of them of course they can they can lead to chronic renal disease or chronic kidney disease so um well, like these are the things which we are going to discuss today and uh, by definition uh, what is CKD it is uh, you can see like it is a pathophysiological process with multiple etiologies resulting in irreversible nephron numbers and functions uh, or decrease in nephron number and function and frequently leading to end stage renal disease uh, like uh, this is to tell what the condition is like the kidneys are not functioning anymore but uh, the clinical definition is a little different that I will talk in a while and uh, what is ESRD or end stage renal disease again it's a clinical condition where there is irreversible loss to the nephrons and of course the kidneys cannot function properly it cannot maintain the uh, the demands in the body and ultimately it will need to some sort of renal replacement therapy which could be dialysis or transplantation uh, in order to prevent like life-threatening um, complications due to that and uh, uh, two terms one is called as azotemia and what is what is called as uremia so azotemia is when there is rays of uh, uh, urea as well as uh, creatinine in the body but there like there is no clinical symptoms so we call it as azotemia but whenever the clinical symptoms are there so we call it as uremia so uremia is a clinical and laboratory syndrome reflecting dysfunction of all organ systems as a result of untreated or undertreated acute or chronic renal failure so remember like i'm going to add one more thing over here uh, that is called as uh, <coughs> azotemia okay um, azo Azotemia, okay. So azotemia is what? Yeah, of course, it's just a laboratory syndrome in which um, there is increase in the uh, urea and creatinine in the body, but uh, without um, any clinical signs and symptoms, we call that condition as azotemia, right? So remember this thing. This is also a term which will keep on like coming again and again. Uh, now, um, <laughs> to talk more about the definition of CKD, uh, what I'm going to tell you is um, it is progressive abnormality or abnormalities of kidney function uh, for greater than three months so we call that condition as CKD uh, with either the following things so not uh, now what are the things which we see the glomerular filtration rate is less than um, 60 milliliter per minute right per 1.73 meter square uh, body area right so uh, of course like uh, the G GFR is markedly reduced okay and of course, like the, the GFR depends on the body surface area, so that's why they include this thing as well. Um, or you can say if you will see the markers of kidney damage, they are there. So what are they? Uh, they are, of course, uh, albumin, urea, um, small, shrunken kidneys, uh, especially like... Uh, <clears throat> What we do uh, on ultrasonography, they see like the size of the kidney and then also they can measure the size of the cortex. So what happens 
uh, when the kidney size are less than 9 cm and uh, there is increased cortical echogenicity on ultrasound they call it as small shrunken kidneys okay when the kidney size is less than 9 cm and that the cortex is uh, uh, giving increased echogenicity or you can say if there is uh, uh, pathology um, on biopsy like of course uh, why this thing is included because you know uh, most of the kidney conditions um, they are diagnosed on biopsy right so that's why this thing becomes important so <laughs> remember like this is the definition and uh, uh, now to tell you uh, how we classify uh, like how much the kidneys are damaged is basically uh, on the staging okay so like this one is one of the uh, staging you can see like uh, don't read this one of course like these are uh, the actions and the symptoms but what I am talking about right now just about this section uh, so basically if we, we classify the kidney uh, failure according to the categories we divide them into five categories rather than six categories because three have uh, two categories right um, like you can see like when the GFR is more than 90 um, so the description is what like um, uh, of course the, the kidneys are functioning normally okay so uh, what is the thing here for example if you are having something like protein urea or hematuria but the GFR is more so of course we call it as, as category one like because there are uh, protein urea as well as hematuria going on but like the GFR is maintained degree two is like you can see like 60 to 89 GFR okay so uh, like uh, there is of course kidney damage with decreased GFR uh, for example in this one maybe on the biopsy you can found some abnormalities or tubular disorders or things like this um, stage three which can be further divided into uh, 3a and 3b but like you can remember it by this way so 3a is basically 45 uh, to 59 and uh, stage 3b is basically um, 30 to 44 okay so like here it is collectively written as 3 so of course like in this one you can see in this one mildly reduced GFR but in this one moderately reduced GFR and stage 4 is of course when the GFR is severely reduced like 15 to 29 and stage 5 is of course a kidney kidney failure when uh, the GFR is less than 15 so like uh, this is the important thing and uh, this is the classification which is done according to GFR right by the way there is also classification of CKD by the levels of albumin urea okay so uh, the, the stages for chronic renal failure uh, like okay whenever uh, the GFR is less than 30 for sure like you know we say like the kidneys are severely damaged okay so this is like stage 4 and 5 is um, something um, in which like you have to put the patient on uh, renal replacement therapy because the kidneys are not um, functioning enough to maintain the, um, the the functionality what kidneys must be doing right so uh, uh, I, I, I did not include the chart for the albumin, albumin urea rather I will talk about that a little over here okay so uh, when we classify it according to the albumin levels so basically what we check is like either we check the 24 hours albumin excretion or uh, like one thing which I talked in the first lecture of nephrology that is ACR albumin to creatinine ratio now uh, A1, A2 and A3 like uh, these uh, uh, stages are also called as G1, G2, G3, G4 and G5 uh, it's like if, if you will found G3 it means like it is glomerular filtration rate like G remember from G so it is stage 3 and that one is denoted by A1, A2 and A3 so um, um, A1 is like anyone when the albumin excretion is less than 30 uh, milligram per 24 hours uh, A2 is like 30 to 300 and A3 is like more than 300 okay and same thing if you have a good concept about what is ACR or albumin creatinine ratio so less than 3 is A1 3 to 30 is A2 and uh, more than 30 is a3 okay so uh, a note can be added like uh, can also be uh, what you can say uh, <clears throat> classified according to um, according to albumin 
albuminuria, right? Or uh, albumin to creatinine ratio. Okay, in that one it is denoted as A1, A2, A3. Very easy to remember. A1 is less than 30, A2 is 30 to 300, and A3 is more than 300. So uh, this is also a way of cl uh, classification of CKD, uh, which is done on albuminuria. Uh, this is also a way of classification for uh, CKD according to the glomerular filtration rate. And one more way of classification of um, this condition is by when you can see the causes, okay? So what are the causes uh, of chronic renal failure or chronic kidney disease or chronic kidney injury? Okay, CKI. Um, now, to tell you more about this thing, uh, see a lot of causes are written, but, you know, they are not written in the way which I want you to remember. Uh, for example, the most common cause of chronic renal failure in developed world is diabetes mellitus, okay? So, diabetes mellitus is causes most, most of the chronic renal failure and then comes the uh, glomerulonephritis like this one, okay? So, I remember before this, there is one more cause that is diabetes mellitus, which is of course written over here, right? And then comes the hypertension, okay? Uh, so, uh, which is written over here, right? So, the most common cause of uh, uh, chronic kidney injury or chronic renal failure in developed world, number one is hypertension, sorry, diabetes mellitus, number second is glomerulonephritis, number third thing is hypertension, uh, and number fourth, like there are other causes like polycystic kidney disease, reflux nephropathy is there, analgesic uh, nephropathy is there and in some of the cases we, we cannot found the cause what is the cause of renal failure so uh, anyhow uh, move further okay is uh, to talk uh, more about uh, chronic uh, renal failure of course like all the causes are in front of you uh, there are many people who have chronic renal failure in this world a lot of people you will find when you start working a lot of people they are on dialysis a lot of the people they are on the list for getting the transplant uh, for renal transplant okay or a renal replacement therapy in the form of transplant you can say so you can see over here what are the causes see uh, glomerulopathies okay primary glomerular diseases we had done discussed all these things secondary glomerular diseases like the diseases which are secondary to some other things or systemic conditions like diabetes or lupus nephropathy or post infectious amyloidosis, HIV related, collagen vascular disease, sickle cell, HIV, tubular interstitial diseases, uh, hereditary diseases, APKD, which we have done, medullary cystic disease, it doesn't cause much in very, very, very few cases. Alport syndrome is a congenital syndrome, as well as obstructive nephropathies, of course, the uh, incidence is too low and the vascular diseases, renal artery stenosis we had discussed, discussed recently, and hypertensive nephrosclerosis. So see, uh, uh, just a good concept is we can classify chronic renal failure on many bases. Number one, we can classify it according to the GFR. We can classify it according to albuminuria. We can classify it according to the, uh, according to the causes, right? So now... Um, the important thing to discuss over here is, okay, the clinical features are not so much, but the management is very interesting, okay? So, uh, this one is like the leading cause of uh, CKD and ESRD in China. Um, but like uh, what I told you, uh, basically, I'm going to write over here, okay, um, that, that one is going to... Uh, give you more, uh, what you can say, better picture because uh, um, diabetes mellitus should come on number one thing, okay, as, as a number one thing. And you can say 44% of the times in developed world, you know, uh, it is caused by this thing. Why? Because, you know, I, I am taking my figures from some books which are written in the developed world and they give the figures of, of their countries. So in developed world, okay, uh, I'm changing it. Uh, just to give you uh, <clears throat> the overview. Then uh, uh, it, it could be glomerulopathies, it could be hypertension. So um, to tell you the truth, like I have seen the books which says glomerulopathies is the 
second most common cause. Okay, for example, I can give you the reference of the book. Um, uh, I'm talking about uh, the statistics which are which you can take from the NICE guidelines. A little older, not new one, but many of the books they say this one is the second most common. So uh, uh, rather, I would put this one as a third one. Uh, around 10% of the patients they have this thing okay and I, I would like to put one more condition over here that is hypertension okay uh, nowadays that 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 cause very uh, what you can say a lot of renal, chronic renal failure and that is around 25% of the patients they have um, this thing okay and then like there are other causes and all this one so of course like I'm going to remove all this one uh, just to include these three the three mains and of course like you can say others in others, you can talk about all the things, uh, APKD, hereditary, 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 congenital, secondary vasculitis, secondary glomerulonephritis, drugs, toxins, all these things, right? So you can include in this one. But if you will see, uh, roughly, um, they collectively make more than 70%, okay? Uh, all these causes which we, which we have discussed. So uh, talking about the pathophysiology, guys, like... Uh, uh, it doesn't make any much sense to talk about the pathophysiology rather because uh, uh, it makes more sense to know about the complications, what complications a chronic renal failure will cause because if you know how many causes are there and many of the things we have discussed, so uh, you must know what is the pathophysiology, right? And uh, for example, this one, they are showing a renal pathological change in CRFC. This is the normal one. This is like sclerosis is there, right? A lot of sclerosis or fibrosis is there. And that's the reason, you know, they have this thing. Okay. Uh, see, it is written like what is the pathophysiology and biochemistry of uremia. What urea will do, see, it will cause malaise, vomiting, headache, anorexia. And there will be a lot of nitrogenous ex uh, excretory products like, and they are going to cause many abnormalities. Uh, as well as there will be less erythropoietin and all this stuff. Okay. So like if you know the functions of the, kidney you can remember that thing uh, i want to talk here uh, give you uh, other than pathophysiology a best way to remember uh, uh, it in this way like what are the complications and how to manage them so let's go on the clinical features and then i will give you how to remember these things okay uh, anyone who have uh, uh, chronic renal failure guys of course uh, um, it, it, it will be diagnosed on the basis of the clinical picture, right? Um, now, uh, the important thing is uh, uh, the clinical picture will be uh, like this, that, of course, uh, um, there will be uremia for sure, okay? And what uremia causes is nausea, vomiting, pruritus, and encephalitis because the nitrogenous waste products will start collecting in the body and they cause all these things. Uh, now imagine there is no erythropoietin, so there will be anemia. Okay, uh, now uh, uh, the kidney cannot maintain the electrolytes, so there will be acid-base balance. For example, there could be metabolic acidosis. The kidneys cannot excrete the water outside the body, so there will be volume overload. Uh, edema will be there, okay. And of course, there will be hypertension, as well as, you know, uh, bone mineral disorders will occur because of decreased calcium. Okay, so see all the things are written over here. Fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base disorders will be there. Bone diseases will be there, uh, and dis disorders of calcium as well as phosphate metabolism will be there, and a lot of other abnormalities will be there. But they are secondary to all the causes, all the things which which basically kidneys are functioning. Uh, uh, now this one is talking more about uh, on molecular level. You know what will happen to sodium and all this stuff. Okay. And uh, what, why, why there will be hyperkalemia? Okay, so all those things uh, are basically the explanation of those. Of course, like uh, I'm, I'm not going in detail of that. Okay, uh, <clears throat> but rather I will talk more about uh, um, wait, uh, like for example, bone disease. Why it will be there? The most common disorder is osteitis fibrosa. The GFR is reduced, phosphorus excretion is impaired, there will be hyperphosphatidemia, and of course, at the same time, there will be hypocalcemia, 
which will stimulate the PTH or parathyroid hormone. So there will be secondary hyperparathyroidism and there will be high bone turnover with osteitis fibrosa. So um, again, like this is all the things which is occurring in um, what you can say, uh, renal failure, right? And so like this slide covers a lot of, you can say, uh, things which which uh, is like which will uh, like the changes which will occur in the body okay of course like you know uh, due to uremia uh, there will be pericarditis okay uh, there will be hypertension which will lead to left ventricular hypertrophy there could be congestive heart failure and there could be ischemic cardiovascular diseases so of course like you will found a lot of explanation of that okay in this one so um anyhow uh, of course, if we will uh, discuss these things, you know, uh, I'm more interested in talking about the management and the clinical features uh, which are related to that. So, kidneys also produces erythropoietin and when there will be no erythropoietin, of course, like there will be anemia, right? And of course, when there will be anemia, it is going to um, create or uh, make many other conditions even worse like for example there will be increased cardiac output cardiac enlargement ventricular hypertrophy okay uh, all those things so like almost every system is affected in um, chronic renal failure okay so and uh, now uh, uh, what will happen see the retained nitrogenous metabolites and middle molecule toxins as well as PTH all contribute to, to the pathophysiology of neuromuscular abnormalities there will be restless leg syndrome okay of course like these are the people who who get like some uncomfortable feelings in the legs and they uh, have this thing and uh, like the explanation of all these things right uh, so uh, now uh, the important thing what you can say uh to 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 tell you about the clinical features is basically um how we take the history of the patients of chronic renal failure of course um uh, chronic renal failure is will be diagnosed on the basis of gfr or albuminuria okay uh, remember it's a lab diagnosis or you will say check either the uh urea or creatinine are raised or not okay so remember guys you know uh uh, even the 10% of the nephrons, if they are working in the kidney, so the kidney are able to maintain uh, the creatinine and urea. So uh, whenever the urea and creatinine are raised in the body, so always think like the kidneys are very, very, very badly damaged and that's why they are raising. Okay. So of course, like first of all, to make the diagnosis of CKD, we must have in our hand the lab reports of urea, creatinine, as well as the GFR levels or the biopsy report, for example. Okay. In these patients so of course on the on the history you uh, you will found about the uh, drugs the patient use uh, if they have any history of diabetes if, the, if they have any history of hypertension um, if they have any history of the previous creatinine records uh, if they have any history of uh, um, UTIs okay um, family history of diabetes ischemic heart disease uh, renal stones for example is very important to ask okay um, like maybe you will found a patient with apkd and he will tell like his father was having the same condition so of course the thing is done if the patient is having what you can say some hearing abnormality with renal failure think about alport syndrome okay so all the things of course we will check and like a very nice way is to do a systemic review uh, think about the joint, like talk about the joint pain, talk talk about the other symptoms which can occur in uh, what you can say chronic renal failure. Uh, ask about the symptoms of fluid overload like peripheral edema, uh, chest pain, uh, ask about anorexia, ask about nausea, vomiting, ask about restless leg syndrome, ask about fatigue, weakness, pruritus, bone pains, uh, impotence, okay, so all the things like we will talk in the history. So, and when we, when it comes to the examination, uh, of course, like an examination, what we are going to find is uh, uh, there will be edema, there will be edema, okay. Uh, there will be there there could be neuropathy. Uh, there could be, uh, for example, if the patient is a diagnosed patient of renal failure, maybe you will found a fistula on his hand, uh, mostly on the left arm. Why? Because uh, 
Now, once the renal functions are declining, so they 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 make a, a fistula, so that you know because fistula needs like around one month to get mature, and then we can do dialysis from that fistula. So if there is a fistula on the hand, so for sure it's a patient of renal failure. Okay, so uh, when, while examining, always pay attention on a fistula. Okay, so uh, when we do the examination of renal failure, so we do look the sign and symptoms of renal failure as well as we do look the sign and symptoms of diabetes, the sign and symptoms of hypertension because they are the two most important conditions which can lead to um, diabetes, diabetes uh, sorry, kidney failure, right? So, uh, look for the signs of any immunosuppressive drugs, look for the signs of any uh, surgical marks on the abdomen, right? For example, maybe the patient had already received a kidney transplant, okay? Or uh, if when, when, when anyone have renal transplant, you know, we, they, we put them on immunosuppressive drugs or steroids and maybe you will found like um, skin infections or uh, bruising from the steroid use and things like this, okay? So, uh, look for the signs of anemia, look for the signs of uh, uh, lipid uh, or like uh, hyperlipidemia like xanthalasmas, okay? Look for the signs of joinders, for example, in hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, many of the patients who are on cyclosporin for, and they have already taken renal transplant, maybe you will find gingival hyperplasia in them. Uh, Cushing uh, white features, uh, periorbital edema. Okay, so all these things can be checked. Uh, then very important thing that, you know, whenever we evaluate a patient for um, renal failure, you know, uh, See, examination of the abdomen for renal masses, of course, in APKD or in the case of transplants. Uh, examination of edema is very important because this will guide you either the patient is having fluid overload or not. So what you will do, you will check the JVP, um, you are going to check the, uh, auscultate the lungs for any uh, pneumothorax, for example, or any pulmonary edema. Uh, you will check for edema in the sacral region as well as in the uh, like ankle area, right? So, or like the lower tibial area, lower legs. So, we always check for these things. Uh, check, check, check the blood pressure, uh, check for any uh, signs for endo, uh, infective endocarditis because the patients of renal failure, they are mostly taking dialysis and that's the reason that uh, you may get what you can say. They, they are prone to get infective endocarditis, okay? Especially in the countries where the care is not so good. Uh, many people, while getting dialysis, they get infective endocarditis as well. So, uh, all the things we will check, we will check for um, any scar marks on the tummy uh, because, uh, like, uh, many of the people, they, they undergo peritoneal dialysis as well. So, when they go undergo peritoneal dialysis, of course, uh, you can find uh, scars on the on the on the abdomen, right? So, uh, see, that's how we do uh, the examination. So, uh, when we are examining a kidney uh, chronic renal failure patient, guys, it's not about examining the signs and symptoms of uremia or fluid overload. It is also about looking for the signs and symptoms of the cause of the kidney failure, which could be diabetes or hypertension or any X Y Z like vasculitis or other condition. Uh, we also look for the signs and symptoms of fluid overload. We also look for signs and symptoms of any uh, renal replacement therapy, like uh, how we give renal replacement therapy. Either it's by hemodialysis, so you can find a fistula, or you can find a central venous pressure line in their chest, or either it is due to uh, cause, uh, either it can be a type of peritoneal dialysis, so you will find scar marks on the abdomen, or either uh, the patient has already received. Uh, uh, renal transplant so maybe you will found a scar mark in the pelvic region okay uh, why we uh, you know they, they they always put a transplant kidney in the pelvic region like uh, like in the left near the left iliac fossa or the right iliac fossa why uh, because uh, that's an easy side excess side to take uh, uh, biopsies or do further investigations later on so that's why they they put it on a more um, you can say approachable place right so all these things, of course, we, we do in these patients. So uh, but this is more like a clinical assessment, okay, uh, of uh, whenever we examine anyone uh, of 
uh, renal failure. Now, renal failure patients can come in emergencies as well. Of course, like uh, in that case, the, maybe the patient is having some uh, like uh, worse type of complications of this thing. For example, maybe the patient will present in coma. Maybe the patient is drowsy. Uh, maybe the patient have uh, fits. Maybe the patient have arrhythmias. Maybe the patient is having metabolic acidosis. In that one, there is, you know, Kussmaul's uh, respiration you can find. So, um, uh, like, guys, maybe you 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 are find finding it hard. The, what I'm talking about, but uh, this is uh, a package for the chronic renal failure patients. Okay. So that is about uh, all the things which uh, which you can say. Okay. So. Now, going further, um, okay, uh, what are the lab investigations which we can do, right? Uh, now, um, again, like, I, I, I will be talking about a lot of lab investigations as well um, uh, in these patients, why? Because uh, uh, they are needed, and uh, then we will go on to the management. Okay. Uh, <coughs> And then we will discuss, you know, the complications of what you can say, um, CKD, okay, uh, after finishing this, the labs, okay, which we have to do in the patients. So talking about the labs, how we evaluate a patient of CKD or what are the investigations we can do in the patient of CKD, um, they are many, okay. A kidney is doing a lot of functions starting from... Um, uh, what you can say, um, starting from maintaining the acid-base balance or excretion of nitrogenous waste products, it is also the one which is making erythropoietin. It is also the one which is uh, controlling the calcium metabolism by activating the vitamin D. Okay, so the kidney is doing a lot of functions. Now, the kidney damage or failure have a lot of causes so of course when we talk about the investigation we have to talk about those investigations as well so of course uh, when we talk about the investigations uh, we have to talk about all the investigations uh, which are related to the function of the kidney or we have to talk about all the investigation related to the structural uh, integrity of the kidney both microscopic as well as macroscopic and we have to talk about all the uh, causes of kidney failure and we have to do investigations to talk up to uh, look uh, how uh, is the for example um, current status of the body okay like if there's any fluid overload or, or not right so uh, when we talk about the investigations uh, in the slide because you know this slide I made uh, before a uh, few years back um, for sure, like, first of all, you can arrange the things in this manner. Uh, like, you know, if I will uh, write down the things and uh, uh, all these things, you know, uh, so it will take a lot of time just to talk about uh, uh, the investigation. So that's why, you know, I, I'm, I'm using the same slide. So the same things are written, right? Uh, here, it's like immunological tests should be done, urine analysis should be done, measurement of plasma creatinine, and estimation GFR should be done, metabolic bone disease assessment is done, should be done, hemoglobin should be checked, and imaging should be done, okay, as well as you can see renal biopsy uh, should be done, and what are the contraindications to renal biopsy, and uh, establishing for the diagnosis and etiology of CKD should be done, okay, so a lot of lab investigations are there, right, so talking about the lab investigations, and again, my way, uh, starting from uh, what you can say, uh, the most less interventional and going to the more interventional um, and also talking first about uh, uh, the bloods and then about uh, other imaging, you know. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will take you in the, that way. So, uh, for example, when we'll talk about the blood, see, uh, urea and uh, electrolytes should be done 
and compare it with the previous available reports um, do a CBC okay uh, by the way these things we can we can uh, we can write down together okay uh, in a new slide um, so that like you you guys should have an idea what I'm talking about okay so what are the investigations which can be done uh, of course like in this one I'm going to talk about all the investigations okay uh, which we can we can do in the in the patient so so starting from um, CBC should be done what you will found you, you will found anemia there is no erythropoietin so uh, what kind of anemia it is normochromic normocytic type of anemia right uh, you will check the urea levels and creatinine levels they will be raised okay uh, you will check the electrolyte levels um, there will be hyperkalemia as well as there will be uh, calcium or and phosphate abnormalities the calcium will be increased reduced and phosphates will be increased okay so of course like uh, and when we are talking about electrolytes and we already talk about calcium so okay we can add this and so calcium levels uh, plus uh, phosphate levels okay and uh, what is the abnormality which occurs in um, renal failure patients is uh, and uh, what you can say um, PTH levels okay so parathyroid hormone levels will be raised okay and uh, that's why you know there is uh, something called as renal uh, osteodystrophy uh, in the patients right so now what is renal osteodystrophy um, again like uh, this is of course like the bone bone problems which occur in the uh, renal failure patients okay so uh, we we do this thing okay uh, these investigations to to see uh, like either either they are there or not right so uh, like uh, uh, there is hyperphosphatinemia and hypocalcemia right and there is of course like the the vitamin d cannot be activated in these patients so uh, we can do this one and uh, what other basic investigations you can do um diabetes mellitus so glucose levels okay glucose levels can be done in these patients okay uh, other bloods which you can do is uh, uh, okay yes you will check for the auto antibodies now uh, here of course I will not talk about all the autoantibodies because still you are lacking the knowledge of rheumatology but okay antineutrophilic antibodies or PNK or CNK or all these proteins can be checked okay um, or especially you know um, anti glomerular basement membrane protein uh, antibody we had done that thing um, like HIV can cause hepatitis B can cause Hepatitis C can cause, so you will do hepatitis or serology as well, okay, as well as um, cryoglobulinemia can also cause, okay, so hepatitis uh, serology um, can be done, okay, because they can also cause um, this condition, okay, so all the things can be done, and then it comes to, uh, then we'll go to the urine, so again, uh, uh, urine examination like, uh, um, routine examination as well as culture as well as uh, sensitivity okay you will do as well as you will check the albumin levels you will check albumin to creatinine ratio and you will check for Benz Jones proteins uh, now if you remember what we had done in uh, what you can say um, hematology and multiple myeloma I'm talking about so in multiple myeloma there could be renal failure so see like the causes are too much then uh, when we talk about the imaging ultrasonography can be done it, it will tell you the sizes of the size of the kidney of course that will be reduced okay and increased echogenicity of the cortical region will be seen okay uh, the kidney size will be less than nine centimeter as I already told you okay uh, so that can be done of course uh, uh, CT uh, scan can be done MRI can be done uh, you know I told you about DEMSA scanning if you remember like see my first lecture and uh, DEPSA scanning uh, as well so these scanning should be they can be done and the last but not the least you know biopsy can be done of course like in biopsy they are going to like we, we can get exactly 
uh, what is happening in the kidney right so a lot of things can be done okay uh, uh, you can say uh, drug levels can be done as well so the investigations are too much because the causes are too much the functionality is too much so that's why the investigations are too 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 many okay so uh, these are all the uh, things of course we are going to check in these patients and uh, uh, then we are going to talk about what you can say uh, the management of the of the uh, chronic renal failure right so uh, when it comes to the management part um, again um, okay uh, before going on to the management part guys uh, there are many reversible factors uh, like if there is infection treat that obstruction relieve that if you remember, like, you know, we had done this acute kidney injury, extracellular fluid, volume dep de 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 depletion is there, give fluids, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, and hyperuricemia is there, treat that, nephrotoxic agents, ask drug history, stop them, hypertension, treat them, okay, all those things uh, uh, we can check. Now, there are two goals. Number one, if the CKD is there, but still like it is functioning so um, decrease the progression of the of the ckd and that's how we do um, again is uh, uh, two main things which you can do uh, by the way I, I, I want to show you something over here um, okay see this one okay uh, this is called as a heat chart okay uh, uh, and I told you like CKD is classified on two bases, you know, A1, A2, A3, and G1, G2. This is the classification I was talking about, okay. So, like, see, whenever the, there is adults with diabetes, hypertension, or older than 60, or a family history of kidney disease, we request a kidney profile in which they check two things, ACR as well as GFR, okay. And then, they, according to these, you know, this is called as a heat chart, uh, and they decide, like, you know, in which category the persons fall and what are the chances that they are going to uh, get or have uh, deterioration in the kidney functionality okay so uh, when we talk about the the thing for example um, whenever someone have a kidney disease so the target blood pressure uh, for patients with proteinuria is to maintain it less than 130 by 80 and the first line drug which we use is ACE inhibitors okay or angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist we can use this thing and the other thing for example we have to um, lower the risk of getting heart condition so what we do like uh, uh, we give them aspirin we give them statins to control their lipid profiles as well okay and then of course we 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 talk about and we have to uh, manage the complications of chronic renal failure see Disorders of mineral metabolism is there, hypertension is there, cardiovascular disease can occur, uremic pericarditis can occur, congestive heart failure can occur, anemia can occur, abnormal hemostasis can occur, and of course we can give uh, renal replacement therapy. A very easy way to remember this one, I will tell you now. Now, I will tell you a very easy way to remember this thing, how to remember uh, guys, you know, don't write these kind of mnemon mnemonics in the exams. These are just to make uh, your own concepts, okay, and your own uh, memory points, okay. So remember, what is the f uh, functional unit of the kidney? It is called as um, nephron, okay, N-E-P-H-R-O-N. -E so nephron. So remember, N is for... Um, like the nitrogenous waste products you know they can be increased too much okay because of kidney failure so how what we can do is we can give them low nitrogen diet okay so that you know the nitrogen of waste products should not be increased in the body um e for electrolytes so remember electrolytes what kind of electro uh, light problems can be there hyperkalemia right so monitor their potassium levels okay what else um, what else is uh, um, p for ph okay what can happen metabolic acidosis treat that okay 
uh, other than that uh, uh, h is for hypertension treat that okay uh, what else r is for rbc's uh, what is there hey, anemia right so give them erythropoietin treat that um, o is for osteo um, dystrophy okay so this is the bony bone condition which occurs due to uh, decreased calcium levels, increased potassium, potassium levels, as well as like increased parathyroid hormone levels or secondary hyperparathyroidism. So, <clears throat> uh, give them calcium tablets, okay, uh, what you can say to increase their calcium levels in the blood. So, and as for um, nephrotoxins, okay. So, uh, when it comes to the nephrotoxins, of course, avoid all the drugs which are nephrotoxic. Don't give them uh, uh, NSAIDs, don't, don't give them uh, drugs like gentamicin and all these things. And also, adjust the dose of all the drugs which the patients are taking. So, a very easy, like, uh, easy mnemonic to remember this thing. But uh, we are going to talk about uh, what you can say more about how to, how we manage the patients of uh, uh, chronic renal failure right okay so uh, in the management uh, uh, of course like uh, um, we have to decrease the progression okay uh, we have to wait uh, we have to decrease the progression okay um, uh, again the same thing uh, we have to uh, treat any reversible causes if they have uh, we have to treat the complications of renal failure, okay, and we have to prepare the patient for renal replacement therapy, okay. So, uh, first of all, like, you know, of course, like, whenever there, there is any patient who have uh, uh, this condition is, like, of course, we, we uh, uh, like, refer them to the uh, patients of, sorry, uh, nephrologists, okay, uh, so that, you know, they must take care of the patients of uh, renal failure. So, uh, talking about the diet, uh, of course, like, uh, uh, not just the diet, but like everything, uh, the first thing we do is like, uh, we have to prevent like fluid overload in them, right? So, uh, wait, okay, so we have to uh, um, decrease the fluid overload in the patients, right? And prevent hypertension, of course, so you can say hypertension, and you can also include fluid overload in them. So for them, that, you know, what we do, we uh, restrict like sodium and we also ask them to restrict the water intake, okay, uh, to some extent, of course. So volume control with salt section is an essential therapy and uh, uh, we restrict like potassium, uh, like we ask them to take less potassium and how we ask them to take less potassium is to uh, don't eat the things which ha are uh, have too much potassium for example we we ask them don't eat bananas okay and many other things of course and you can check the list or you can see the diabetic diet what diabetic people can eat so they restrict uh, potassium okay uh, other thing which is increasing in the body is phosphates okay so we uh, restrict phosphates in them as well and also, we ask them don't take any extra dietary magnesium, okay? So, uh, that's a very important thing we do. And uh, at the same time, we have to treat their hypertension. Guys, um, ACE inhibitors are the first line and are the best drugs. Why? Because uh, they, they decrease or they, they slow down the progression of the renal failure. Especially, they decrease protein urea as well, okay? So... That thing is very important. We give them ACE inhibitors. The target is to keep their blood pressure less than 140, um, 90, okay. But if the patient have uh, diabetes, so we, it should be, con uh, should be controlled less than 130, 80. What I'm talk talking about is about the NICE guidelines which are given by UK, okay. And when the GFR is very, very much reduced, you can add um, diuretics, okay. When the, when the GFR is too much reduced, we can give diuretics in them. So this thing is the important thing. Um, second thing um, you can see over here, um, we restrict proteins, okay? So protein restriction with adequate calorie intake is given 
what we want we just want to stop or limit any uh, protein catabolism in the body okay so that thing you can see a major goal of protein restriction in CKD is to slow down progression of nephron injury and protein restriction should be carried out in the context of an oral dietary program that keep nutritional status and avoids malnutrition so metabolic and nutritional studies indicate that protein requirements for patients with CKD are in the range of 0.8 to 5. no need to remember these things okay uh, this is not your domain anyways so uh, that thing is done so what we have discussed until now water restriction salt restriction potassium restriction calcium give them um, phosphate restriction um, uh, don't take extra magnesium uh, control their blood pressure and protein restrictions as well uh, other than that uh, uh, the important things, yes, we ask them to like uh, change their, their lifestyle, modify, like we ask them to modify their life, okay. And what are the things we, we can ask them to modify in their life is, uh, of course, the diet comes the, the first thing. And uh, we ask them to do exercise, maintain healthy weight, smoking cessation should be done, okay. Uh, and uh, treat congestive heart failure, treat uremic pericarditis but like that thing by by the way i'm going to talk in the end okay um other things which we have to do or take care in these patients is of course uh how we prevent uh, heart failure or any ischemic heart diseases by decreasing their uh, lipidemia levels or hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia we can give them statins okay so um, you can say uh, over here that nephron is a very good mnemonic by the way just to know so uh, for dyslipidemias they have dyslipidemias they have so uh, what can we can give them statins okay statins are the drugs which we use for them um, now uh, we give them calcium supplements okay uh, calcium supplements should be given uh, to them uh, of course, like uh, they need them because uh, they have hypocalcemia, so uh, it should be given between the meals, okay? Uh, because you know why it is given between the meals? Because if you will give them with meals, so you know basically calcium, uh, when you will give them with meals, so they bind the phosphates, okay? So they are of no use. And uh, also give them uh, what you can say, <clears throat> calcitriol. What is calcitriol? It is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Okay, when the patient have uh, are hypocalcemic, we, when we give them calcitriol, okay, it reduces the PTH levels or it simply like improve the bony conditions as well. Uh, the phos phosphates are too much. Okay, of course we we do restrict the phosphate, but uh, we can also give them a drug called as um, Sevilamir. Okay, and what it does basically, well, like what this drug is, it's basically a um, phosphate binder. Okay, so uh, this is given uh, in the patient, especially when they are both hypercalcemic as well as hyperphosphatinemic. So, of course, this is the one which, which bind the phosphate and decrease the phosphate level. Uh, rest of the things, you know, uh, the acid-base balance, what is this type of acid-base balance they are having is metabolic. Uh, acidosis okay so what can be given for for them um, bicarbonates okay uh, bicarbonates can be given uh, and uh, they have anemia so what can be given erythropoietin uh, injections okay uh, to increase their hb level okay and the target hb which we try to maintain in them is between 90 to 105 gram per liter uh, many of them they have they have clotting abnormalities are also there so we can give them DDAVP okay uh, so all these things uh, can can be done um, now guys you know the important thing or oh, oh, like uh, this one is the guideline to improve the anemia right uh, by erythropoietin and if you want to study of course you can study like again nice guidelines are there and many other guidelines are also there okay so uh, this thing uh, now um uh, okay so i think i had covered almost all the treatment things which what we gave so uh, like i can i can repeat them 
uh, if you want. Uh, number one, I told you, number one thing is to decrease the disease progression. What we can do? Control the BP. Which drugs is the best? I told you ACE inhibitors, right? Uh, what is the target? 140 90 if diabetic 130 80 okay this is the uh, blood pressure we will maintain in them okay so what are the drugs which you we use we use ACE inhibitors okay uh, ACE inhibitors are the best and the first line okay uh, so um, now um, the, this thing is there uh, if they are diabetic okay very important uh, sorry I, I forget to talk about this one uh, very 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 important uh, in in decreasing the uh, what you can say the disease progression okay uh, the progression of the disease uh, it is like uh, control uh, uh, diabetes okay so uh, of course like we are going to control their diabetes okay uh, that's very 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 important point I forget to remember so like keep them a uh, tight glycemic control put them on insulin if they uh, cannot maintain on the other drugs okay uh, lifestyle modifications I talk a lot of things okay exercise healthy weight smoking cessation salt restriction potassium restriction phosphate restriction magnesium restriction um, treat anemia by erythropoietin treat acidosis by bicarbonates okay uh, treat edema uh, by lifestyle modification by restricting water but and salt uh, but if needed we can give them uh, loop diuretics right so uh, <laughs> uh, by the way you know like one of the thing I wanted to tell you like first of all to decrease edema we can use loop diuretics but sometimes when the loop diuretics are not working enough so we will add uh, them with thiazide diuretics so that that have a very 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 powerful effect uh, so uh, as you know like there is bone disease as well and uh, there is increased serum phosphate as well as reduced vitamin d because the vitamin d is not activated by the kidney so we do measure pth we do measure calcium as well as phosphate and uh, what we can do for phosphate we can give phosphate binders as well as we can restrict phosphate uh, give calcium between the meals give vitamin D supplements like uh, Yes, this is also important thing by the way uh, vitamin D supplements uh, which uh, One of the thing I told you about calci triol, okay, uh, one of the thing is you know, we can give coli calciferol, okay uh, coli calciferol uh, can be given <coughs> sorry spelling cholecalciferol cholecalciferol can be given as well okay if vitamin d is deficient uh, we can give this thing okay so all these things we can do in the patients okay uh, many of the patients you know they have restless leg syndrome like as it was written before i show you so that thing, thing can be given uh, by improving their sleep hygiene as well as giving them drugs like uh, gabapentin uh, or pregabalin or you can say dopamine dopamine agonist agonist drugs okay uh, dopamine agonist is not recommended for that but like uh, you can say you know these drugs are called as off license use okay for restless leg syndrome okay like syndrome we can give this one uh, this one okay uh, protein restriction I talk about that and uh, we have to treat the complications uh, of CKD and one of the complications is cardiovascular disease I, I show you the uh, chart as well uh, we control the lipid levels by giving them statins okay and uh, yes that's it like this is all the treatment uh, of CKD so all the functions which kidneys are doing, they are all disturbed and we are trying to manage them. Now guys, the last treatment which I wanted to talk about is when to give renal replacement therapy, right? So of course, like there are indications for that uh, when we have to give them renal replacement therapy. So, okay, um, this renal replacement therapy, I think we are going to include in the next lecture because this one is getting too long, right? It will be trouble in uploading. So thank you so much guys for listening. I'll see you around.